So I'm going to talk about the Everyday Peace Indicators, which is a project that I've been involved with for about four, five years. Um, and the way I want to organise between now and 10.30 is simply to talk. Okay? No. There are two ways that you can stop me talking, okay? Because you may have noticed that people from Northern Ireland talk a lot, <laughs> and they talk really quickly, okay? Quite that no one in particular. So, you know what's coming at you for the next hour and a quarter. Okay, good. So, uh, the tagline of um, what I'm going to talk about is can we really hear what people are saying? And that's getting at a really important issue, I think. And that is, if we work hard enough, we can actually elicit a lot of bottom-up information, a lot of crowdsourced information. But actually gathering the data isn't the same as listening. And it certainly isn't the same as listening to it. So the, the most important bit of this sentence is here. Can we actually hear? You know, does it sink in? And that's what I'm, where I'm going in this talk. But the talk will meander and it will be interrupted by you. Okay? Good. So, I suppose the starting point of this is orthodox indicators of peace. Orthodox ways of measuring peace. And often these happen at the national level. Often they occur across the nation. But of course we know very often conflict happens in a particular part of a country. I remember being in Colombo in Sri Lanka in the diplomatic quarter and having lunch, crisp tablecloths <laughs> and people um, with accents of so good, fine BBC English that I felt like a peasant in their company asking me about English county cricket, which I, you know, would whoop over my head. <coughs> Yet, 300 miles away was an active war zone. And the Sri Lanka that they inhabited was very different from the Sri Lanka that others were inhabiting. But of course, in national level aggregate data, that's all evened out. The anomalies are evened out. And you get something that, well, isn't terribly accurate. So it's aggregated, it's national level. Very often orthodox measures of peace aren't measures of peace at all. They're actually measures of conflict. Or they're measures of negative peace. Even look at the Global Peace Index, which is a jolly good thing. But it's actually largely a measure of negative peace. And they, they actually claim that they're measuring positive peace, but then take a look at their indicators. It's things like prison population. That's a measure of negative peace. Or we measure the dead. And very often, as you know, political scientists invent arcane rules. So they invented a rule to say that a war, a proper war, is 1,000 battle deaths per year. If you meet, if, 99, if 999 die, you don't have a war. I'm sorry. You just have an armed conflict. You know, sorry. Back to the queue. And what happens if you're 1,000? dies from dysentery 50 miles from the battlefront. Is that counted? So we have these weird rules that are arcane, that are rigid, that involve straight lines in a world that is incredibly messy. Very often measures of peace are restricted to programs and projects. So we see uh, cases in which projects linked to peace have been successful. They've been successful in the burn rate of spending money. They've been successful in uh, delivering deliverables on time. They've been successful in hiring people, in training X number of people. 
A really good example, again, comes from Sri Lanka. And of course, you know that the Sri Lankan government some years ago attempted and succeeded conflict termination through the eradication of the LTTE. That involved massive human rights abuse of, abuses, the killing of tens of thousands of people. Yet, at the same time, if you look at programs by major INGOs and the lead European Union and UNDP, you will see success, success, success. Because they delivered. Yet, at the same time, major conflict ongoing. Yet, those programs and projects are taken as indicators of peace, which of course is nonsense. Very often, measures of peace are related to political elites, men in suits, in diplomatic capitals. Very often, political uh, uh, peace indicators are related to events that happen, peace agreements, rather than the things that don't happen, or things that happen but they're not filmed because they don't involve the media. They happen 200 miles from the capital. And in a sense, there is a huge under-researched area in non-events and peace. We're very much focused on events. And when you think about events, think about, say, the popular revolutions that led to uh, the revolution in Ukraine that is filmed, that we got hourly updates, we could be there real time. When you think about those revolutions in the squares, they were very male. They were very urban. They involved the people that were there. What about the people that weren't there? That were at home looking after loved ones, looking after elderly relatives. So we focus very much on counting events rather than non-events. Okay, so that, in a sense, is a very short critique of orthodox ways of measuring peace. And I'm a bit of a skeptic. Okay, so um, that got me thinking, my, my um, cynicism about orthodox top-down indicators got me thinking about the everyday, trying to get beyond this, trying to get beyond men in suits making peace uh, in diplomatic capitals. I was hugely influenced by the work of GMC Scott, who is a political scientist turned anthropologist. And he writes about societies having a hidden transcript about how uh, there are public transcripts, which are diplomatic communiques, statements by politicians and, and governments. And then there are <clears throat> hidden transcripts, what we really think. And even we, people interested in peace, all of us, we all have hidden transcripts. There are certain things we say to a close intimate circle that we wouldn't possibly say to our bosses. We all have a hidden, the capacity for a hidden transcript and a public transcript. Okay, but how do we access that hidden transcript? How do we get to what people say out of earshot? How do we get to those conversations that happen around the kitchen table? Conversations between long-standing friends over a cup of coffee, when they use the vernacular, when they know bosses aren't listening, or uh, the politically correct aren't listening. I mean, one thing that I, that I do, I, I, as you can imagine, I'm a, I'm a slave to fitness and athleticism. So I, I follow my 12-year-old Labrador uh, <laughs> down the road in my village every morning um, at about this pace, okay? And then we go back, okay? And it's fascinating. Not 
walking with a 12-year-old Labrador because he's, he's largely silent. Um, <laughs> conversation with him is, is usually poor. <laughs> but I live in a village where no one works at a university. It's about 50 miles from the nearest university. And I usually meet the other dog walkers. And it's fascinating because if you work at a university in the UK, you tend to socialise with and have conversations with people who only listen to BBC Radio 4, who would only read The Guardian or the now defunct Independent or the Financial Times. They don't read The, da the Daily Mail or The Express, the sort of mid-market bad noise. <laughs> I, I know of no colleague, no colleague at any university I have worked at who has ever bought a local newspaper. Yeah. You know, why? Unless you're buying a house or something, but it's all on the internet. Um, in other words, there is a transcript that is very different to, uh, very difficult to access. How do we access those conversations? How do we access the Shirley's? It's a serious point, because very often we're working for INGOs, for NGOs, for universities. We are separate very often. We are professionalised. In some cases, in fragile environments, we operate from compounds. We've got a very securitized um, environment. So how do we access the local, the mundane, the everyday? How do we access this in terms of peace? So I'm not interested in the peace agreement so much, very important as it is. I'm interested in this. And we can see what's happening. The dog and the cat wanted, you know, a convivial evening. But this could kick off at any moment. There could be teeth, fur, you name it, flying. Blood. <coughs> they have to find a way of accommodating each other. <coughs> and that's what I'm interested. I'm inter interested in. I'm interested in deeply divided societies, often post peace accord where people have to rub up against each other. So I'm interested in what happens on public transport in a deeply divided city. I'm interested what happens in the stairwell of the apartment block. I'm interested in what happens at the local corner shop when someone uh, needs cigarettes or butter <coughs> or whatever. How do we as social scientists, as academics, as peace and development <laughs> workers, access that. And that involves us to try to capture the local, capture the micro, and to think very seriously about these local and global connections. To act, and to do that, that means possibly de disconnecting <coughs> the local from the global and seeing the local in its own right. Because when we have this confection local, global, or global, local, local is immediately the poor relation. It's immediately somehow peripheral. It somehow becomes primitive. It somehow is antediluvian, it's old, it's undeveloped. But it's very difficult to deterritorialize de the local, but at the same time, as well as seeing it as a space, as a place, as terrain and territory, we also need to see it as a verb. We need to see it as agency. We need to see it as people doing and making. In a sense, the local is a noun and a verb. Yet again, how do we access that? Because very often, we're city-based, we're urban, we've limitations linked to language, logistics, etc., etc. So it's, 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 it can be difficult to access the local. I holidayed about uh, two weeks ago further up in Scotland, which was 
an interesting experience in battling water uh, from all directions. <laughs> and, uh, I, I went into a, a pub, I should have known better, uh, I went into a pub and it was called the Pretoria, uh, <laughs> after a sort of apartheid South Africa city. Um, it was one of those occasions, I, I, I went in, uh, I was waiting for takeaway food, I went in for a, a swift drink, door opened, the bar, and I could see the backs of 12 men, most of them wearing football jerseys, and almost like owls, all 12 heads turned around and looked at me, and the place fell silent. How do you access that local? You know, as this specky geek, uh, you know, it's not my natural territory. So that is, what int that is, in a sense, the challenge. There are problems, I think, about accessing this uh, every day. Uh, we've just heard uh, from Colleen the, the, the point about how it can be dismissed as journalistic, anecdotal, not serious. It doesn't uh, meld very well with existing indicator platforms. Um, and also the social sciences, the academic social sciences, I think pose <coughs> quite serious boundaries or barriers to accessing the everyday and the local. Many of the social sciences have worked very hard to take the social out of the social sciences, the, to take people out of social sciences. Many of the social sciences work with very large um, uh, data sets. There is the holy grail of big data. Uh, in a sense, removing people from the equation. The social scientists, sciences, when you think about it, are an exercise in generalization, about ironing out unevenness, ironing out the anomaly to make generalized claims. I'm not dismissing that the importance of that. But what I'm saying is that there is a political economy and a series of gatekeepers who are very much against research that is very people focused and is dismissed as being anecdotal, journalistic, um, too narrowly focused. <clears throat> And of course, a lot of the social sciences work on national level data, which as we saw earlier, often is um, a, an abstraction. And then there are problems in terms of accessing the locals uh, with um, university ethics committees. I, at the moment, a, the University of Manchester Research Ethics Forum it stands at 56 pages. Mm -hmm. um, much of it is entirely justified and should be there. I'm not in any way um, advocating um, research that is unethical or harmful to research subjects. But universities are increasingly risk averse. I, I'm on the second case at the moment of a Colombian PhD student who has been refused access uh, or permission to go to Colombia to conduct research by a committee stuffed with um, experts on 19th century French literature um, who know <laughs> next to nothing uh, about the context whatsoever. And this is a very serious um, situation facing the social sciences where the costs, the barriers to fieldwork are being raised extremely high. And that means that people go back to existing data sets. They do existing, uh, they do desk-based research. And then there are um, all of those issues of cost and logistics. Um, it's hard work to access the local, to access the everyday. Um, Robert Chambers, uh, the development studies expert, many years ago made the observation that um, research was biased towards main roads, and it still is. Um, it absolutely still is. Somewhere like Nepal, um, you know, incredibly mountainous, incredibly difficult terrain. Um, it's much easier to stick 
to the roads because if you go off the roads, cost goes up um, because people are away from home for night, night after night and the cost of any project. And the project began with, uh, in a sense, an intellectual midlife crisis that I was having. I was uh, reflecting back on my childhood and here I am uh, in 1974 in Northern Ireland. I, I got this photograph very recently. I, I, I'm one of the boys in knitwear, uh, I leave it like that. Um, I was thinking about when I was growing up. Northern Ireland, as you know, had a, had a very small, very minor, yet very bitter <coughs> civil war. It doesn't deserve to be mentioned in the same breath as somewhere like Syria, uh, Iraq, a very different order of things, but very disruptive, very deep division. My parents were shopkeepers in a small town. And in the early 1970s, my dad's shop window was blown out by a bomb explosion. First time it happened, replaced by insurance, no problem. Second time, the insurance, no way, you're on your own. And he and all the other shopkeepers replaced the shop window with wood, just with with wooden boards, not very attractive if you're running a clothes shop, as my dad was doing. And that situation pertained for two, three years. And then my dad had the confidence to invest in glass again. Something happened to change his mind and the mind of the other shopkeepers. Now, at the time, the British state was also connect collecting top-down vast amounts of information. Demographic information. Information about the sectarian breakdown of unemployment, of employment. Breakdowns of information on when attacks happen, their linkage with weather patterns, with time of year, agricultural cycle, you name it. All sorts of statistics were being collected. But my dad knew something that the British state didn't. And I was really interested in this, about these informal ways of knowing, about accessing these unwritten spaces. And I came up with, I, I was on a sabbatical uh, in the University of Notre Dame in, in the US, and I was hugely influenced by literature from critical geography and by ecology which was writing about how they were breaking down the barriers between the researcher and the researched. They were writing about civic epistemology, about trying to use plural methodologies, breaking away from academic disciplines uh, to be very interdisciplinary. So I came up with the notion of everyday peace indicators. And the big unique selling point of the everyday peace indicators was that rather than a pointy-headed academic coming into a society and saying, here's a list of indicators, tell me which ones are relevant, that we go to a society and we say, what are your indicators? What's important to you? So the, so the key part was to go and ask people what their indicators were then to turn these into surveys and roll these surveys out into <coughs> communities. We would do this in my lovely scheme um, using participant uh, action research, working with local organisations. So it wouldn't be white guy from the Global North doing this research, it would be local communities doing this research, using their own language, their own vernacular. Um, so we, we would gather lo uh, local indicators through focus groups, separate ones for men, women, youth. We would have verification focus groups in each locality. Then these, these indicators would be turned into a survey. The survey would be rolled out and then we would repeat the survey to see change. It looked great on paper, right? this lovely flow chart. Um, and I felt very proud of myself. And then something dreadful happened. I got funded 
for this to actually happen. Um, and I had to, as the term is, operationalize uh, this bright idea. And thankfully, at that point, someone from the University of Notre Dame, Pamina Fershaw, came on board. Um, whereas, you know, I was able to come up with, with this wonderful idea. She is one of these people who, you know, gets things done and uh, bosses people around, etc., etc., uh, as well as being a top class scholar. So we, we turned it into the Everyday Peace Indicators Project, the donor mandated that it had to happen in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. We rolled it out in South Sudan, Uganda, Zimbabwe, South Africa. Three localities in each, okay? And those localities were chosen according to whether they were urban, rural, whether they had a lot of peace building in input, uh, not very much peace building input, whether they had recent conflict or not recent conflict. Um, so, uh, the project looked a bit like this, um, going to somewhere in Uganda, um, often rural, off the beaten track, uh, finding communities, holding focus groups, then getting lists of indicators together and turning it into a mobile phone survey. And I, I can point you in the direction of our project website if you want to know the details of how we did it. Um, key findings, international relations and NGOs, they're not very relevant to how people live. No one in the hundreds of, well, uh, almost a hundred focus groups that we uh, conducted, no one mentioned any of my work. It was remarkable. <laughs> no one in rural South Sudan said, I read your latest piece and I thought, it, whoa, wow. Um, how people narrate their lives is actually very interesting. <coughs> International organizations tend not to be mentioned. Development, reconstruction, interventions tend not to be mentioned. People in talking about their local lives tended to be very political in the sense that they talked about economics, they talked about day-to-day -day concerns, but they didn't talk about big political issues. One of my fears was that in focus groups people would simply repeat what they heard on the radio last night. They would use a political vernacular or possibly even use an NGO vernacular that uses phrases like conflict transformation or transitional justice. People didn't. They talked about the neighbour and how their neighbour's son stole their bicycle. Um, it was, in a sense, keeping it real and every day. Gender screamed out of these transcripts uh, in a way that it doesn't scream out of many policy documents because it's usually in a separate section. It's been sort of mainstreamed out of existence very often. Um, <coughs> crime was a key issue in all of these post-conflict uh, societies. And actually that finding on the next one, the, the precariousness of economic life and crime, gave me reason to question this notion of political settlement. Because what wasn't evident at all was a settlement. What was hugely evident was the morphing of conflict from one type of conflict into another conflict. There wasn't a handover <coughs> point. There was no neatness in this. So those are key findings. Um, and I'm speeding towards a, a, a conclusion. The number one indicator of peace is that whether the dog barks or not. The barking dog is a sign of prowlers, of insecurity, of criminals <coughs> prowling. So a key indicator of peace is if the dog is quiet. Now, and, and that indicator, we're, we're just rolling this out in Colombia, and that indicator is being confirmed, fascinatingly, amazingly cheap self-reproducing devices. <laughs> um, 
you know, so don't let anybody tell, sell, you know, very problematic. Everybody says, well, you know, this wouldn't work in Muslim societies. Of course it wouldn't. Yes, they're local. Shut up. Okay. Um, you, you may have heard or find that I've given this presentation before. Okay. Um, number two indicator is having to pee indoors. In many of these societies, people use an outdoors latrine. Um, uh, but if they feel insecure, they would urinate at night indoors. Now, you can imagine that the language of barking dogs and peeing indoors is not the language that international organisations use. It's not the narration of top-down analysis of conflict. It's not the conflict analysis vernacular. It's not, it's not the diffid language, in a sense, largely. Uh, this sort of thing, but you know, maybe the, the evidence box uh, contains barking dogs and some urine. Um, okay, so to race to a conclusion about these everyday peace indicators, this is what I found. And it gets back to your question. This is really messy. Um, a lot of people would say that's not art. You know, it's, it's a Jackson Pollock splatter painting. And if you look very closely, you do see pattern in it, but you have to work really hard to do so. Yet, in a sense, what many donors and what many international organisations and what many academics want is this. They want this 2020 vision. They want this top-down, very neatly packaged very understandable view and I think we have to be real we have to say that we are constantly between these two that this is real life and we have to move away from the notion that we're in the laboratory to move away from the notion that we can actually capture actuality that we have to um, in a sense, we have to move away, or sorry, we have to move into territory that is happy enough with good enough methodology. And that is very difficult because academic gatekeepers, donor gatekeepers, and many others don't allow that to wash. They want this fictitious evidence trail that is overly neat. And I think the point that I'm trying to get across is that we have to push back in our own respective fields and say that's unrealistic. I live in a messy world and the picture I'm going to give you is really messy. And if you don't have the systems to listen to that, to understand that, then that's your problem. That says more about you than it does about those societies. And I've had conversations like that, obviously much more polite um, in uh, international organizations and I have to tell you they haven't gone well.